Hello, it's September 27th, 2017. I'm Tony Smario, coming from my father, brosal.org YouTube channel. And now, uh, well, I noticed that, you know, we're in the limbo of, of Big Brother Tube, where we just, uh, even though we have 250 subscribers, we get 30 or so views. So congratulations for you few. Uh, I still think it's a very unique uh, perspective that we're offering, and I appreciate those that contribute to our um, to our search. And I want to say that uh, Dad and I are trying to move this channel into a, a web page and and do more with it. But the consultant that we found has some other um, work that has to be completed first, and so we're sort of in a holding pattern, and it's a little frustrating. But I think. We have a long way to go still and a lot to watch for, and I'm sure it's all going to come around in its time. But because of that, I'm also going to get back to the Bible study this week. I'm really missing that. It's actually the, the part I would like to continue more than anything. The rest of this stuff's becoming a little bit too obvious and easy to watch, and I don't think it merits the sort of attention that we've given it for the past 20 years anymore because it's just too darn simple for anyone to um, watch what we've been saying even the last six months. It should catch you right up and you should be able to watch the stage of history in a way that no one else is doing without me having to hold everyone's hand week to week. But it is fun to have um, a place where we all you know, can share our thoughts. And so I do appreciate the few that do because it keeps it uh, you know, lively for for dad and I as well. But anyway, we're going to get back to the, the Bible study here. In spite of the fact that we have no audience, it doesn't really matter. We're going to just keep laying down the, the revisionist look at it, as, as we've been doing now for some time. And we'll get back to Genesis. Uh, and anyway, so look forward to that, please, this week. Today, I just want to, um, you know, I'm noticing how exhausting it's all getting. And I'm feeling you know, unfortunately confirmed that over the past six months to a year, I've really been seeing the nature of this game that they're playing in the media meant to exhaust us through all of their you know, mandala effect and the flat earth meme and NASA's a fake and Nibiru, and uh, they're setting dates for us. Jonathan Kahn had the Shemitah year two years ago. Funny how everybody knew about that. Some religious angle. Yet I've been trying to argue a religious angle for many years about the, you know, the, the invalid nature of the, the Jewish state claiming to be, you know, God reaching. Why do the Christians all want to claim that this is God returning the Jews? Don't they know the scripture? Nah, they're not interested in that, but tell them about a Shemitah year, a Shemitah judgment on the USA. You know, start some meme about the LBGT movement or the homosexual, you know, gay rights. Uh, gay people can get married now in America, so that's it. Now God's got to bring on the end of time. You know, all these ridiculous things that have nothing to do with Scripture and yet emerge as the popular memes in the in what's become uh, the very centralized popular social media outlets, right? We don't have... You look back a hundred years ago, even when, that, when the few uh, independent journalists that were left were complaining about the corporations already getting their way in journalism and that nobody, you know, there wasn't any honest journalism left already. Everybody was writing what they were, was okay to write and be paid to write. And even back then, you still had a hundred different sources of, say, independent journalism fighting to have a voice out within this journalism that was being taken over. But you look at today. I mean, you, you think you have a hundred voices, but I've already demonstrated that's all the new boob tube. That's all Big Brother. There's no alternative media. The alternative media is the alternative mainstream viewpoint. And the mainstream viewpoints become just a red team, blue team, 
I mean, it's such an obvious paradigm. Nobody in what's called journalism is able to uncover the, you know, the, the surface level of anything and ask a question about why anything is the way it is. Why the crazy weather isn't being dealt with on the level of the patents that they report about in another part of their mainstream media when they tell you about science and technology. But when it comes to telling you about weather, oh, they seem to forget that they reported that, you know, we got patents to make storms and make rain and heat the atmosphere, cool the atmosphere, change the direction of the jet stream, cause earthquakes, break storms down, stop hurricanes from forming. Anybody that you know in the meteorology been talking about, you know, how those patents are being applied to the storms this year? after a 12-year absence of storms reaching the mainland over there in the Atlantic Ocean. And now it's, you know, boom, boom, boom. And okay, it just seems like a natural cycle. Yeah, and, and I'd be happy to accept that if you didn't tell me for the last 50 years that you, you're manipulating the weather and you can make hurricanes and you can stop hurricanes. You can fuel them and you can blow them apart and you can move them. And you, I mean, that's what you've been telling me through your mainstream media in your science and technology department. But now in your meteorology department, you don't seem to have any clue that you told me you got this technology. So, you know, come on, you guys. Is this possible that we live in a world so absurd? And so now through social media, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, oh boy, the whole world is on the same page when it comes to getting the authoritative voice, finding where to get your authoritative flavor of red or blue. It will be on one of those channels and someone will be directing you into the right group to satisfy your your taste. So, and I find that the ultimate or the just the overall effect of all this is exhaustion. It's just exhausting. We're... We, it's what I've been saying now for some time that if their plan is exhaustion, how how's that going to happen? Well, I, I believe I said a while back that financial exhaustion is what brings everybody to their knees in our society. Other societies, it's something else. But in our society, it's financial exhaustion. And I don't know how we're going to pay for Houston, Florida. Puerto Rico, right? California burning down, the West Coast, Oregon, Washington. That's not to mention just the aftermath now of the food losses and the transportation effect on public transportation, on all the, you know, the public works effect. You know, so I was seeing this, that, that it would need to come to a real financial push and now we have you know so many reasons coming about i think not least of which is we have to keep building all these weapons and having all you know we have reason in the world to keep having drills we got to keep practicing terrorism drills we got to keep getting together with south korea nato to you know send planes we got contracts we got to build more weapons in this world you know that's coming apart through earthquakes and famines and you know, the food and the floods and the all these things. But hey, uh, at the same time, everybody's ready to kill each other. I, mean, I just found out watching the news the other day, Venezuela telling their people, prepare for war with the USA. <laughs> I almost fell out of my chair. Venezuela is coming to war against the USA. That should be. Did they see how Iraq did when they went to war against the USA? As far as I remember, Iraq had a lot more weapons than Venezuela. So, that, you know, come on. What, what are you talking about? What, what, what kind of headline is that? What does that mean? Venezuela is going to war with the USA, like North Korea. Yeah, I guess all the North Koreans, they just don't care if they get blown up. And, and so I want to start this, you know, examination of the exhaustion by looking at what to me can only be described as the tip of the iceberg when understanding a perspective on the lunacy, on the, you know, the big brother nature 
the completely mind-bent Orwellian, even platonic, lost-in-the-cave nature of where they have people today. That they show you a Donald Trump standing in front of a security council talking about annihilating millions of people. As if it's just, well, Rocket Man. If little Rocket Man keeps talking like that, he won't be around for long, right? We'll wipe North Korea off the map. Really? That's what we'll do? Because it's shooting a rocket over Japan? <laughs> we won't first send a SEAL team in like we did with Osama bin Laden and take Rocket Man out? Have you demonstrated to me the person who, you know, has to support, theoretically, as an American citizen, such an idea that we would annihilate a country off the map and kill millions, tens of millions of people? Um because they threaten who? I mean, who are they? You know, what is the real threat? How many of their people are ready to die for this? Is this a nationwide sediment? I'd sure like to know that before I start talking about annihilating a country. And I'd sure like to know that I still live in a country where it's not up to Donald Trump to annihilate people or countries. I mean, how come nobody's talking about Trump makes these remarks, but of course, do the American people want to nuke North Korea over this? Do the American people believe they are threatened, or does Donald Trump just believe he is threatened? Because when they present it in the news, you'd think it's really just, I don't know, we got to talk to Donald and see what he's going to do. And, and I, I just, I keep I've been saying it now, I think since the whole time we've been on the air, Dad, that to me it's mind-blowing. I grew up in an America where you had to at least keep pretending that the American people were somehow voting for this, that the, you know, the Congress had to get behind this, that the, you know, this would be something the American people would have to decide. Of course, none of that was ever true, we find out in history, but they had to at least make that pretense. You couldn't pretend, well, Ronald and Nancy are going to go home tonight and decide if they're going to nuke Russia. You know, you just didn't, you couldn't present it that way. Ronald Reagan's up there saying, that's it, Vladimir Gorbachev, you either tear that wall down or it's goodbye, Russia. We got a bomber with its sights on the Kremlin. We're coming. You know, wouldn't Ronnie theoretically have to get the okay from the American people before you could even, you know, what kind of empty hot air, or you, you, the President of the United States is out there threatening to annihilate a country like it's a friggin' cartoon, like you're watching the wily Coyote chasing the, the roadrunner, just like they showed you on 9-11, a plane that flies right into a building like the building's made of butter. Even the tips of the plane cut right into the building, just like the Roadrunner goes right through the rocks. I mean, it's the life's a cartoon. Kim Jong Un, he just, I mean, nobody in North Korea cares whether this little rocket man were to, you know, result in the annihilation of their country, since I'm not sure what chance their strategists feel they stand against the military of the United States if they were to actually fire a nuclear weapon at Japan or Guam or anywhere that affected people. Eh, the response would obviously be overwhelming from the United States. And I don't I still haven't seen anything that shows me that those people have have a mind for that future. That they've been somehow oppressed. I mean like I say you look at that country, it sure doesn't look like these poor people in Myanmar. Right? Doesn't look like these poor people in Yemen. Doesn't look like these poor, you know, the, the people in Sudan. Yeah, I mean, you look at North Korea. Heck, their streets are brand new. Their cities are brand new. Everything I see about North Korea, they look high tech. They don't look like a people that's so oppressed. They're ready to go to war and be annihilated just on the, on the principle of the thing that they won't be kicked around any longer because that's, the kind of war it would have to be, right? You don't think you're going to actually get your way if you attack the United States, right? I mean, does anyone think North Korea thinks that? So 
they present it that way because they have to turn it into a cartoon. And I say there's a psychological part there that people don't really want to, you know, have to grasp or get their mind around or put the energy and the responsibility into, into um, acknowledging that they're playing our minds that way for something. And I say it's this exhaustion because your mind just can't, you, you just can't keep relating to this world. It doesn't make any sense. And all of a sudden, you're, you, we're going to kill millions of people because Donald Trump says that's it? He's gone too far? Of course, none of that's true, but the fact that they even present it that way shows you the kind of world you, you live in, right? The severe weather is if, as if we don't possess all these patents to do something about it. ISIS, as if... I mean, how long have I been pointing out, look at the way they're playing this every week now for six months. They're on the edge of getting ISIS. We're on the verge. We're on the verge. We're on the verge. We're on the verge. We've been on the verge. And I and in all of this on the verge, has anyone seen any footage of actual fighting? Anyone seen a dead ISIS soldier laying in the street? Where You know what I mean? And where are they running to? And aren't Isn't anyone being killed in this great war that's resulted in as many bombs being dropped as Vietnam and all this kind of stuff. So again, just, it's a cartoon. It's all a cartoon. And as I said, you can bet that ISIS is just the cartoon part of the story that's there until they change scenes when it will be, what do we do with this territory now? But for now, it's still got to be the threat of ISIS, threat of ISIS, because we're not to the full exhaustion yet. There's far, there's more to go, obviously. You got these genocides that don't seem to be important in the news, you know, as far as the mainstream news. You know, they give us all the hype about what will the poor victims of, you know, hurricane this or that do. And, and of course, it's a terrible time right now. You know, the people that are lost everything, you know, all over the world. And in America, it's so new to us, but Jesus, this is normal to the people who we've been stealing resources from in Africa, Asia, India, you know, all, all over the world for the last hundred years. We, we've been putting people through this and now it's coming home and isn't it awful? And imagine that on top of what we're finally going through with all the you know, m more resources than anyone to deal with it. We, we do have helicopters coming in, maybe not enough, but we have people coming in even to save our animals. We have people coming to help us, setting up food, shelter and things. You know, a lot of people in Africa and Asia and Yemen, and, you know, they're just dying. They're just starving to death. They're dying of cholera something that shouldn't be killing anyone anymore in the modern world. But we're killing people again by starvation because that's how these maniacs like to do it. And so, you know, you get your genocides going on all over the world, which is certainly bringing in an exhaustion. It's not talked about, but it's bound to bring exhaustion. You, you look at what's going on over in Yemen, and it reminds me of the, the prophecy that Sheikh Hossein speaks of from the Quran that's part of the final, the signs of the last days, a fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to their place of, of assembly. So I you know, don't understand uh, the exact rendering of that. I know the way Sheikh Hossein points to it, but it's certainly, I don't think, a um, any sort of... Uh, insignificant perspective right now to notice what's going on in Yemen with these Shia Muslims and, and, and the way that we see that we've been talking about the future we're watching for, for the division of the Sunni and Shia now into something where a Sunni Arab can come up over all that land and, and they can make their peace with the Jews and the Shias can object and that can all eventually lead to a war that brings Russia and China in on Iran's side. But to get to all that, you need a world exhausted and ready to do whatever the deal makers tell them. 
And so they're killing people all over the world. They've been killing them there in Syria and Iraq and Iran. I mean, they've been killing these poor Muslims in the Middle East now, since that's the focus of World War III. We've been killing them there for so long. And, of course, in Africa, because we covet all those resources and we can't let those people have any. So we've got genocide always going on over there. And now you got these poor people in Myanmar. And, you know, I'm not, it's a, it's an ethnic cleansing sort of genocide. So they're, they're getting the Muslims out of there to give it to whoever they've made the deal with, see, and to divide the people. Cause see, they want war. They, what's coming is all out war, brother against brother, father against son. All out war. How do you do that? You push people to the absolute brink. You divide people down every line to where everybody's either with you or against you. You you're either got your the people, your posse that you're trying to stay alive with or everybody that you have to fight to stay alive. And that's what they're doing. I and mean, to me, it's so obvious. Like I said, Venezuela. They have Venezuelans ready to go to war with the USA. I don't know if that's just silly headlines they put in the U.S paper for stupid Americans, but but still, just to even present that after showing us the just the horrific conditions that have been going on in Venezuela, one of the most rich countries resource-wise in the world. Venezuela should be the Switzerland, you know, of of South America. And instead they're so broke they're in civil unrest, you know, total political corruption, of course, and, you know, now getting ready, I guess, to send their people to the slaughter by talking about going to war with the U.S. I mean, what a, what a sham it is. I'm exhausted just from watching the, the lies, the lies after lies, the setup of lies is exhausting. But the world, I think, is going to soon be exhausted from what we're living through right now, because it's meant to exhaust us. How are we going to pay for all these people that are starving right now that have lost their homes? And how are we going to how are we going to pay for all this stuff? You wait till that becomes the debate, and they start showing where we're going to get the money. Um, you know, global warming. It's becoming the next meme, like the flat Earth. Now it's all about global warming and how the warm oceans are responsible for these. Storm, so they can tell you that they remember that meme, but they don't remember that. Yeah, but what about the stuff we made to break down these storms? Aren't we trying it even with the warmer water? <laughs> we can steer them right. Why don't we steer them toward colder water? Right? Are we asking anybody that? Nah, but global warming is absolutely an accepted meme as the reason to blame for the severe weather around the world. Uh, again, exhausting, because what can you do? Global warming. Hey, stop buying plastic bottles, but what else do I buy? You know, what else do I do? Nothing you can do. It's your fault, and it's too late. Exhaustion, exhaustion, fear, fear, fear. Um, you know, everyone's divided. The nation's divided. The world is shown to us in the West as divided. I'm sure in the world there's as much division as is possible. And, you know, that's, it's, it's so universal that it's hard to believe there's, there's any sort of effort toward the opposite going on. You know what I mean? Any real concerted effort of money being spent and, you know, resources being brought to bear to bring some peace and security and prosperity somewhere. You know what I mean? Is that really going on somewhere? I heard a Fox News analyst, mouthpiece general on one of these shows, talk about how, you know, Trump's, you know, essentially justifying Trump threatening to wipe North Korea off the map because that's the stupidity that the Fox people have to, you know, they have to follow that line of fear that, you know, what can we do? We're, we're the nice guys. We're upholding freedom around the world. And if these people are going to threaten, Freedom, you know, we, we can nuke them off the map, kill millions. Uh, so this general mouthpiece was sort of trying to defend, uh, you know, this cartoon character president statement. Absurd, absurd reality. 
and pointing out that, you know, President Trump's doing what he can to bring peace and security and stability and prosperity around the world. And so he's got to do what the other administration couldn't do, you know, be strong enough. You gotta, sometimes you got to kill 10 million people to bring prosperity to the other 10 billion, right? You see, it's that, if you don't see in there, I, I want to finish by pointing out that underneath it all, is their very pessimistic reality in which most of the people are just stupid sheep, they're dangerous masses, they're, they're unsavable. And if you don't lead them, if you don't call the herd, you're going to lose the whole farm. And so, underneath it all, the people that are playing this tune, I imagine are very happy with with this horrible sound that that's coming out of the world right now it probably looks exactly like what it was designed to look like at this time and a lot of it's probably made to look even worse because fear and exhaustion is is the true psychological method by which they can get everybody to war because they're going to kill everybody through war and famine and pestilence the scriptures say by virtue of the smoke and the and the earthquakes and the the brimstone right the fire and the brimstone and the pestilence well you know how much quarter of mankind third of mankind whatever it was is wiped out so you know, what does that point to? Volcanoes. Now you got over in Bali a volcano that they're saying is imminent to go off. Are they causing that? I mean, who knows, really? It's natural enough that these things should be happening in the earth. Volcanoes, I don't think, are something that's the easiest one to argue. Whether we have a hand in it. Earthquakes as well. We know we have patents that say we can. But those are a little harder to argue where and when and how. We're affecting earthquakes if we are. But these other things about producing moisture in the air or, or disrupting the formation of storms over the open ocean, changing the direction of the jet stream, heating and cooling the atmosphere and such to alter weather. You know, that's all very clear. You know, the, those patents are clear. The, it, it would appear that they've demonstrated their ability to do that. So, to not talk about any of that is just, I don't know. You know that, that becomes suspect of what else are they doing? Do they have Tesla technology? Can they, can they use wavelengths and energy to just send tremors down fault lines at will and dial it up and down? I mean, that seems a little bit, you know, that, that seems to me to push the conspiracy theory to the edge of uh, believing in more than you know, giving them more power than they, they probably have. But I say we don't know. So I look at the bigger picture of saying, well, okay, all the sages from Nostradamus to, right, to, to Shiva, to, to the Old Testament of the Jews, to the New Testament of the Christ, I mean, there's going to be some fire and brimstone coming down and people dying from the shakings of the earth and such like that that would seem to be natural occurrences. And those seem to be starting right now and the words of the Christ seem to say, you know, there'll be earthquakes and famines and pestilence in diverse places. But don't be alarmed, the end is not yet. So I keep trying to bring us back to this picture that we're just in the beginning of the birth pain. This is when you know that, whoops, it's, it's time, the birth is coming. The pain starting, the birth is imminent. It's not here. <laughs> the birth, you know when the birth's here, right? The birth's not here. We got, you know, you got dilation of the uterus and all that kind of stuff. You got things to happen before the birth happens. So we're still watching for those signs. But I say, we're, you know, it, it feels exhausting already. I, I'm starting to feel when I, when I look at the culmination of the last two or three years of, you know, I don't know, maybe even, I don't know, it feels like the whole darn thing now. From the, from the terrorism 
at the introduction of terrorism after the wall comes down. All of a sudden, now you got people blowing themselves up. Just can't have any peace. The wall comes down, but we can't have peace. Now we got terrorism. Al Qaeda, right? We got the threat of Al Qaeda. And then you got 9 11. It's just. I feel like the the whole point has been to to keep us on a road that ends in a in an exhaustive state and so even when there was a chance for things to to become uh, stable or secure or whatever the, you know they, they've always had the means to do that obviously they don't want it that way then you get the financial bubble blows up bubble after bubble but you know, the 08, I mean, you know, so you got 01, you got the terrorism and 9-11, oh, what do we do? Big fear, big problems. So that keeps us busy for a while. And meanwhile, you got the crooked congressmen and presidents coming in and out of office and plenty of fodder to keep everybody divided and chasing rabbits through all that political nonsense. You know, and meanwhile, what's going on? You've got financial plans. Like I say, I don't think any of them have to do with just making money or securing markets. They already had all that when they set out on this plan for three world wars. It's their money all along. They could do it without war if they wanted a world without war. They could do it without weapons of mass destruction if that was their idea of the future. But it would seem their idea of the future is based on too many people that can't be controlled can't be educated, can't be saved. They have to be called. How do you do it? You start calling them, oh boy, it could turn on you. So, then you got Animal Farm. <laughs> but if you can get them to keep calling themselves, find reasons to war, give them the reasons to war, give them the weapons to do it, hey, you can make it all their own fault. Blame it on them, blame it on the weather, blame it on the aliens, blame it on the devils, blame it on the gods and the people, and and then come in and save everything in the end. I mean, I guess if you had the means and a plan, that would seem to be the way you'd want to plan it. You wouldn't want to leave yourself open to just be overwhelmed by circumstances if you could control the you know you, i would think that would be your goal how many circumstances can i control so I'm, I'm not overwhelmed and you go back to things like when they wrote it in places like the, the protocols you know give me 20 years of the media and i'll have everybody march into step you know all the things that are written out there because they're always attributed to the wrong people like maybe pike strategy maybe general pike never did write that maybe you know what's the difference look at the history look at what someone's planning look where the money goes look at the world they create look at the way they own media and they don't own it so it can tell us the truth they they put together these great institutions like a united nations to rid the world of conflict and yet they fill the world with weapons and conflict and use those institutions as excuses for doing the best they can to rid the world. So anyway, I, I say that it's feel, it's already start. I'm feeling the exhaustion, and I think that this is where we're at. We're, we're in this state of, you know, coming to exhaustion. Everything's a lie. We're not going to war with North Korea. The more they say that is because they're starving people, genocidally killing people that they don't want you to know about. So it'd be nice if people woke up to that and at least started screaming a little about it so that those poor souls, you know, have a, I don't know, it just, it feels like the just thing to do. The Spirit of God, we know, uh, or we're told in the scripture is, you know, has a special place for those martyrs and those ones that, that unsung soul that never, never sees justice in this life. And so I feel like there's something inside of me that just wants to scream right now for the injustice. And, and the exhaustion is already, I'm feeling it. 
over this injustice, over the people now that, you know, they have no home to go to. It's only going to get worse. And, and they, in, in my society, simply join the millions around the world who have been forced into those conditions by my great and free blind society that keeps supporting this whole, this big lie that's moving forward in its ultimate goal to cull the world and bring in its own idea of God, you know, their own God themselves and rule the world in their own golden age where the people that are left are simply happy to be alive, happy to be there. Anyway, I'm happy you guys are here, and we'll keep going as long as we can. And uh, I, I think the future will be, you know, brighter in the sense that we will gain a little more access to the people that need this information. I see that there is that potential, and we do have someone I think that can help us with it. Just maybe not today or tomorrow, but it's coming soon. So meanwhile, I'll try, you know, I'm going to get back to doing the Bible studies and, and we'll just do periodic, uh, updates on what's going on here in the 21st century. Anyway, take care of everybody out there, you know, pray for each other, take care of each other, you know, don't be, don't let fear get the best of you. It, it's a, it seems to be a desperate time. You know, if you believe in Jesus, Jesus said, don't be alarmed. And if, if you don't believe in Jesus, then at least know that's what he said, and, and that the Spirit of God is one not of fear. And so there's that, that hope that there's something, you know, spiritually greater, that awakening that everybody's been looking forward to, you know, that, that must be coming out of all of this time. And so the best thing we can all do is help each other and, you know, let let go of a lot of our attachments to the things of this world that have kept us from loving each other. And I don't know. Anyway, that's what seems important right now. Otherwise, the exhaustion, uh, if you're trying to, you know, swim upstream right now, I think the stream is meant to just keep getting heavier and heavier and heavier until it washes eventually even the strongest out to sea. So good luck out there, everybody. God bless you and talk to you soon.